<laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sam Hinsley, artist in residence. And um, today I'm going to start with a comic reading and before I go to the talk. Um, and that comic is called Little Like Yourself. Little Like Yourself, the comic by Sam Hensley. I look like this. Usually I don't like it. Usually I don't. I like it. I live in an awful little house I love. I keep it beautiful with my thoughts, but sometimes my thoughts are bad. Let me make sure I'm screen sharing this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that's Sorry. <laughs> Do any of the robot <laughs> engineers know why it's part of the screen died? Oh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I tried to, to screen share. That. You can screen share the hide this in that. <laughs> okay. No. I will. What's going on? I don't know. Sorry, y'all. <sighs> it's the screen share problem. I'm not sure. It says it's not sharing the screen, so. I can't see it. Um, Let's see it again. Okay, let me take a look. <laughs> It also, it, I need to be able, it says it, I can't screen share and I should be able to screen share so that the people in the Zoom can see the comic. If I could share this. Yes, yeah, so we need the age up. <laughs> the age up. Okay, so hopefully I can. Hmm? Mm -hmm. I don't know yet. But part of the screen is still black, which I don't understand. Do we know what's up with that? Can you open Zoom um, uh, on this? Screen? I can try. Yeah. Because usually that happens to me when there's a video. Um, where is why is Zoom not showing? Okay. So I don't know why it's only showing the chat. Hmm. Uh, Are you in the high Zoom now? I'm going to let you guys know. Okay, so let's try. So. <laughs> You want to try the cable? You just take it out and put it back in. Oh no, you can do the top one. Yay! Okay. And Zoom can also see everything now. Thank you, Nuri. Um, it would be cool if I could see the Zoom. Oh, well. Okay. Little Like Yourself, a comic by Sam Hensley. I look like this. Usually I don't like it. Usually I don't. I like it. I live in an awful little house I love. I keep it beautiful with my thoughts, but sometimes my thoughts are bad. I think these is ghosts. 
I'm not sure where my house and the ghosts are. Outside, I'm imagining an idyllic forest. There's water, and it's been a long time since that I've gone. But look out the window. Well, I have. I forget what was there. Ah, but inside, my mini wardrobe, things I can wear to feel different. Did you see me peering out my window? My lumpy little face? I'm little like yourself. It's not an opinion, it's my name. This page is horizontal. Behind the wall of my little home, my body could be anything. You can only peer in the window. What form would you trust or despise? Well, today, this form, this shape, this face. But someone has thrown a pebble at, at a window, my window. I press my face to the glass. Oh, I rush outside. There's no one in the clearing. I have stupid again. No one is here to visit me. But I check my reflection to be ready just in case. In the reflection, my blemishes and my creases ripple and dance, taunting. It's lucky the pebble was a ruse. I'm unfit to be seen. I'm so sad it starts to rain. I bet it's happened to you, even if you didn't notice. In my mind, a dozen little worlds where impossibly mean things are happening to an ugly myself that is made of fear. I am whelmed with resentment for you. Likewise, I'm sorry. What you've done is beyond forgiveness. I will suicide. <laughs> Each little daydream pain place is then muffled by the shadow of something singular and gargantuan and real. A sweater beast, stories tall, come to hurt me. Coward, if your biggest problem is being favored of no one, you live plushly. Angels with glowing lives have lived and peacefully died as no one's favorite. In little houses on hills bathed in sunlight or isolation. And to the left of the sweater beast, we see the thorns of shame. And to the right, there is the sword of sweater beast. Oh God, it's true. As quickly as here, sweater beast is gone. I rear back to ponder its words, asshole. A life where I am always behind others in the lives I touch, but I'm there. Never first inconsistently held and despite it happy. The only thing I cannot reconcile is that very end. If I am frail, will I be scared? Maybe I will die in a car accident quickly, painlessly with no other casualties. or surround myself with generations of family and they love me, tend me till my end. There's a heat lamp for my old bones. Those are the, yeah. These ways are too, it will not matter if I grow to hate myself beyond comprehension in my old age, but I think I will not. I love most old people. They have seen a lot. Those are the grandkids. It's, it's, this physical place to be spilled. If I am broken, will the gifts box be me when I know its contents? And we have a diagram of the different parts of little like yourself. So we've got artificial non-functioning fashion item wings. Uh, the breaths are stored here in the lungs and unease is stored in the intestines. My guts are ever changing and shifting. Memories of that video where a pigeon is exploded by a fast pitch for Randy Johnson are stored in the brain. <laughs> in the nose, the smell of burnt butter. And in the tongue, the taste of copper, salt, and oil. This dotted line indicates tongue nose placement, if it should be needed. So what does each piece of the me do? I'll tell you, <laughs> I have a helpful diagram. So we have A, the nerve bundle that carries fear to the stomach, feet, and hands. B, 
These fill and they empty forever until they don't. Friendly in, friendly out, poison in, I don't know. C, you know that one. D, star nodes help when little like yourself gets illnesses of the soul. Special things keep them healthy and robust. Letter E, we have not one, but three Cheeto reservoirs. <laughs> F is the important tube. G, intestines are integral. H is the worry bladder, distended in this example. I is the fun ball. And J is the ghost living in each of us. Where is the affliction, Dr. Tendril, that leads me to loathe and dig at my surface? I regret to inform you that it resides largely within your brain. Yes, something you can try is brain syrups. I know I should not be a doctor, but I'm scared of your syrups. Little like yourself left the doctors and thought for a long time. They were tired and confused. She watched murder television every day. Body, bodies broken and fluids spilled, lives ruined and did in seconds. When the danger was inside the television, it didn't feel like it was inside the room. And on the TV, we have Unbearable, I'm scared. She's gone. <laughs> Blood soaked. So, you know, classic true crime television. Um, some part of me hoped that after all that murder television, I would not look like this. She tries some new makeups and hairs. E girl, is it sad that she's 23? She decides certainly not, but still feels shame. 60s mod, she loves turtlenecks. <laughs> 80s glam they miss roller skate they love to feel like a fancy pony and Gomez why does this feel so good <laughs> when little like yourself controls their image they feel much better about it and done haha <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid <laughs> I'll cry forever, till I die, till I forget what you said, till the neighbors think I'm certifiable, till I puke, till I'm not ugly anymore. Little like yourself then cried. A long ass time. All their house plants got big and an ecosystem developed around the new water source. <laughs> <laughs> and Lord, was it loud, the crying. Haven't you ever cried until the floor? But you can't cry forever. And when Little Like Yourself finally stopped, she went outside. Everything was different. They were in a fabulous city, and they couldn't hardly remember what got them so upset. That's the end. I did realize I forgot to wear my feelers. I hope they're in my backpack so you can see. Yeah, yeah. Better this. <laughs> see my feelers. So um, now, if there, I mean, I guess it, say, hold questions till the end. <laughs> but have them. And um, now I'm gonna give you an artist talk. <laughs> Normal way to introduce artist talks. I'm also gonna quiet her down. This is as low as her volume gets. I don't know if you can hear it. Yeah, you can. It gets so much louder. Like why? <laughs> All right. All right. This presentation I've titled The Ghost and the Goblin for reasons I'll explain. I'm Sam Hensley. So I take, I'm starting with where I get inspiration for my work, which is a lot of sources. Um, I really like cute and soft things that evoke um, like purity and like true untarnished innocence. Like 
lambs, almost biblical imagery, though not directly. I love toys and puppets and stuffed animals. And I really like websites where like crazy people talk about the angels that they see by the highway, like that kind of thing. Very influenced by like cryptid sighting, like like Angel Fire 90s websites about that stuff. Um, and in contrast to that, I also draw inspiration from the uncanny horror, um, things that are marred and like not untarnished, things that have been changed not necessarily for the worse, but in ways that make them unperfect, imperfect. Um, and and I, I see a lot of humor in that, like it's less, because I think some people pursue horror for the sake of discomforting themselves. And it, it doesn't do that so much for me. I find most horror, not to be like the Joker, but like I find a horror kind of funny. <laughs> but I mean, it's also scary, but like I see a lot of humor and like I love this sign that was on like an electrical transformer. Not only will this kill you, but it will hurt the whole time you're dying. And like, <laughs> it's, it's the most serious sign there could possibly be. It's very serious and very scary. And it's all, and because of that, it becomes so, so funny. I, that's one of my favorite images in history. Um, so that's like the main driving force behind that work, I would say, is like combining those things. I am really successfully avoiding using the word juxtaposition. That's my main goal here, but it's that. Um, I also love, um, Stemming from my love of toys and my obsession with like just weird old objects that are technically useless but do serve a very sentimental and real purpose. Um, I love old automata, um, automatons. Um, oh, that should have played. So these are from like the 1700s. They're some of the earliest automata that were used for like toys. They were like mass produced for fancy little rich children in France. Um, this is what it would have looked like. And this is one that has been deconstructed for repair. And it's really bad to look at. <laughs> so this would be, <laughs> so like, <laughs> that would be like the earliest example I can think of like, like, you know, proto robotics being used simply to entertain dandy little children. Like it was just something to like have sentimental feelings toward and it served no other purpose. And then also because like all the capacity that you give it to have that sentimentality um, becomes the amount of capacity it has to be absolutely horrible when you remove the familiarity. So I like those a lot um, as like a reference point for what I try to evoke with my work. Um, I am also really obsessed with spiritualism and, you know, not its actual like historical presence, but I love the idea of it and the way that it influenced like spirituality overall. Like spiritualism itself was mostly scams and bad people doing bad things to nice people who wanted to talk to their grandma that was dead. But um, it had a lot of really cool ideas and it kind of like removed a lot of structure from religious spirituality, um, at least in America, that was a purpose that I think it served. And I really like that because it's like all of the interesting like woo woo part in the veil of like organized large religion, but with a lot of that, this, the, um, the intense structure of that removed. So that, that's appealing to me. Um, especially this particular example from the late 1800s, the spiritual machine, which was created by a clergyman and mad scientist named John Murray Spear. Um, he wanted to create a, the second coming, but as a robot. He was like, I am tired of waiting. I am going to engineer this. <laughs> um, and the goal of the machine was basically to ring little bells and it would amplify that sound and you would be able to interpret the bells as a code and those bells were God talking and God was using the machine to communicate with you. And um, I think that's really beautiful. And also I think it's very, very funny. <laughs> um, he was chased out of town and his home burned down <laughs> by an actual mob with pitchforks, um, which is my goal. 
here's, here's a few more pictures of it. He also referred to it as the new motive power and the mechanical messiah. Um, these are, I think this is a reconstruction because like famously the original was completely destroyed. Um, it might've been a prototype or somebody like recreating one of, like maybe a few decades later from his plans. I don't think this is authentic, but it's an idea of it. And I think the sketches look a lot cooler than this one, but um, I think the idea is really funny. And there was a lot of ritual to it as well, like the creation of it. Um, he like found a woman who was willing to volunteer to be the new Mary. And there was some like clandestine ritual involving her that was like supposed to be birthing the machine as the robot Christ, which we don't know what the ceremony was, probably was gross and weird, but I like the idea a lot. Um, if you're familiar with the occult at all, it's uncannily similar to things that Aleister Crowley would do, like, like, uh, I guess, a hundred years later. Yeah, or almost. Um, I would, I would hazard a guess he might have even known about this. But yeah, the, the idea, it, it's almost like the opposite of the Scarlet Woman in a cult, if you're familiar with her. She's like the incarnation of all sin and evil. But occult, occultism is interesting to you and kind of like clamshells with spiritualism in a neat way. Um, see what didn't load. Okay, well, the picture didn't load, but that takes me to the more modern examples of this, like the, the, the ability for machines to evoke both sentimentality and the uncanny. Um, that's really encapsulated with the Furby. I'm sure we've all had one and been creeped out by it, um, at, or at least some of us have. Um, a few years ago, I found this study. Um, it's from the book, um, Alone Together, Why We Expect More from Technology and Less from Each Other by Sherry Turkle, 2011. Um, they basically just observed how children interact with Furbies when they are not interrupted as a way to like learn about the way the like human mind processes a very, very simple, like I don't know if you can even call a Furby an AI, but like something that's mimicking thought and feeling. Like how does a child with no outside conceptions approach this and feel about it? It, it it freaks them out pretty bad, mainly. <laughs> um, so these are some quotes from the article. So like they basically they had a classroom with like twenty kids in it. One Furby, go crazy guys, and um, the children initially were like just talking to it. Come on, Furby, let's go to sleep. Shh, don't touch him. I can make him be quiet. They're like fighting over interacting with it because they're all very excited. This is a robot. Is this a robot? What has this kind of fur? He's allergic to me. It's kind of like it's alive and it has a body. It has a motor. It's a monster. And it's kind of like it's real because it has a body. It was alive. It is alive. It's not alive. It's a robot. It's like they immediately, they immediately got really conceptual with it, which is really funny because they were just trying so hard to wrap their heads around this. And like, this was probably a few years old. In 2011, when this book was published, kids would probably have less trouble processing a Furby now because they're a lot more familiar with technology, but it's interesting. Um, Furbies reinforce the idea that they have a biology. Each is physically distinct with particular markings on its fur and each has some of the needs of living things. They were, they were just pictures of Furbies, so you're not missing a lot. Jessica worries about its pain. When I pull my hair, it really hurts. Like when my mother brushes the tangles. So I think the Furby hair pulls hurt too. Jessica thinks that people like Furbies have batteries. There are hearts, lungs, and a big battery inside. People differ from robots in that our batteries work forever like the sun. She was wrong about that, but no one, it's good no one told her. When children talk about Furby as kin, they experiment with the idea that they themselves might be almost machine. Um, and I think that this is kind of an amplified version of how adults also interact with robots that seem to feel like it, it immediately makes you reflect on yourself. And even if you're completely, completely aware that that is a machine that cannot technically feel, you almost always experience a degree of empathy for it, especially if it has a face. Um, and I think children just do that with like a lot of inhibitions about it removed. And it's just a lot more clear, but um, I think that these feelings are things that I like to imagine people feel with my work, especially like trying to decide whether it feels or not. People tend to be kind of gentle around the creatures. Um, 
they, they, they act like they feel. And um, depending on how the creature responds to them, people will be happy or like have their feelings hurt if it doesn't seem like it likes them. I see that the, I see these things being repeated by adults when they interact with my sculptures, which makes me really happy. But some children become more anxious as the operation continues. One suggests that if the Furby dies, it might haunt them. It is alive enough to turn into a ghost. Indeed, a group of children start to call the empty Furby skin the ghost of the Furby and the Furby's naked body, the goblin. <laughs> One girl comes up with the idea that the ghost of the Furby will be less fearful if distributed. Oh, I guess I, I skipped a part where um, somehow this results in the children taking the Furby skin off. I, we've skipped an important part. They're kid, it's 20 kids in a Furby, so it didn't last long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Furby gets dismantled and they all freak out because they think they killed it. But did they kill it because was it alive and they're having a very philosophical experience and then they're trying to decide if they will be punished for their actions. Um, <laughs> it's like a whole Lord of the Flies arc with the Furby. <laughs> One girl comes up with the idea that the ghost of the Furby will be less fearful if distributed. She asks if it would be okay if every child took home a piece of Furby skin. <laughs> She's told this would be fine, but unappeased, she asks the same question two more times. In the end, most children leave with a bit of Furby fur. Some talk about burying it when they get home. They leave the room for a private ritual to placate the goblin and say goodbye. Um, so they were all very affected by this. I'm sure that they received some kind of adult talk after this to let them know that everything was fine. It was a pretty controlled study. Um, another, it was in a school, which is the interesting thing. And there were children outside the room when they left and like the kids like, were coming out like, we killed it, we killed a Furby. And immediately the other children were like, you're gonna go to Furby jail, do you know that? And so the, 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 the distress was, was increased, but everybody was fine. And I, I think that that study is really, really funny and beautiful and interesting. Um, and it makes me think about how I want people to feel my, about my work a lot. It definitely affected the trajectory of my work. And um, here's one of my sculptures that was too large to bring. This is Sherman. He's kind of um, a convergence of all the ideas I've shared. He's soft, but also a little creepy and insectile and strange. Um, he is the embodiment of an insect angel that came to earth and liked it a lot and decided to stay, but um, stayed too long in a physical form and now is trapped on earth. Not necessarily trapped, but has lost the option to leave. So he, he's the insect angel. He's like six feet long, he's pretty large. And he, it's a pretty simple movement, his head just swings. Um, it is interesting like how much life is immediately given to them, even if there's just like one axis of movement, like, they, like it's the most simple thing possible, but it immediately makes people respond to him much differently than if he were a completely static sculpture, like it, it changes everything. Um, People are a lot more reactive. They want to touch him. That's something I noticed with my sculptures is like typically in like a gallery environment, even if you want people to touch the work, they will not. But people are very naturally like begin to like pet and like poke at the creatures, um, which I like a lot um, because they react to them more like they were an unthreatening animal than a sculpture, which is what I want. Um, this is some footage of my last solo show. Um, it's just a bunch of the critters together. Um, and while that's rolling, I could talk a little bit about what I've been able to do here at Pinovation, which has been massive. Um, so like something you'll notice with all the sculptures here and so far is that they have pretty simple movement. And um, beyond, in addition to that, like I am not really choreographing them. I can change mechanically how they move. I can move parts around and like change like, you know, the, the um, what's the word, the range of movement that they have. I can reduce or increase. I can combine parts onto one robot. But um, 
I, I, I can't direct them. They are more like automatons than robots. Um, I did not know how to code until this year. Um, so I was really more of a tinkerer and a toy maker than a roboticist. And I still can't really say I'm a roboticist, but I'm on my way. I'm working on it. Shane's doing this. It's like, yeah, maybe, maybe soon. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm a roboticist, guys. Um, yeah, and um, so what I have gained the ability to do here at Pod Lab is, um, <laughs> that's SNUB, which stands for Special, Neat, and Under Blanket. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, at Cod Lab, I have learned to, um, I started learning code to prepare for the residency. So just to like very most rudimentary Arduino code. And um, Shane and Diego have helped me implement that to control motors, which is the main thing that you'll want to be controlling when it comes to altering old toys. They mostly operate with motors. Maybe I'll graduate to servos next. They definitely have those sometimes, but it's mostly motor. To most toys are not much different than that crazy like cat that I showed you from the 1700s. Like it's one motor that is controlling gears and mechanisms that cause other movements as opposed to like more like servos and things that would operate a little more like with more control and nuance, I would say. Like they're like automatons that have been given a power source. Um, and if you can control that motor, then you can control the direction they move, the speed and like the intervals with it. So you can basically choreograph their movements. So now I can do that, which is huge. Huge. Um, I've also learned how to connect sensors to them so I can make them motion activated or light activated, sound activated, where before they might've been based on a different input or um, activated by a button. So that makes them much more responsive, which is another one of my main goals because that makes them feel alive if they're reacting to your presence in some way. It makes them both much more friendly and sweet and also depending on the, the vibe, a lot more uncanny. Um, this is the first one. Um, I made this at Worm Farm. This one I actually did make all of the like mechanisms, but not from scratch, but like this one is completely removed from any of the toys that I used to make it. Um, I, I took out individual components and wired them all onto the same battery pack. Um, and I made like a little like, just like rotating thing to like pull his chest up and down. So he breathes, that's connected to a motor that's connected to like a, I don't know the word for it. I'm sure a robot person does, but um, yeah, if you look closely, he's breathing really gently. And he's also pretty large, he's like five feet long too big to bring. But yeah, the uh, chest movement I made pretty much from scratch with like a ruler and a plastic box connected to a motor and then like an elbow, like the joint. And then the ears are from little dancing penguins that wiggle their tails. Those are their tails, but now they wiggle his ears. And that's Boggy, his name's Boggy. Um, here are sketches. This is the guy that I've made while I was here. I don't have a name for him yet. I'm open to suggestions. Maybe when you haven't seen him, somebody could get the ideas. Yeah, so this is a sketch for him. This is the uh, project box that holds his um, circuit board and the H driver, which is the other big thing I learned how to operate. An H driver um, can control, like, so the one I have can control two motors. I guess they all can. It controls two motors and you can have them turning different ways and different speeds. Um, and that's that's really the crew. I also wired up up to a light sensor so he's light sensitive. You know, he's basically like a prototype of what I can do with what I've learned here. He's very small and um, doesn't do anything crazy, but he is a sign that I can accomplish a lot of really wild stuff because he is completely removed from the toys that he was made from visually. And also, nice. Um, <laughs> move him over here so that the ones you can see. Him. <laughs> yeah, his jaw moves, his tail moves, and it moves based on light input with a photoresistor. That's why I need to circuit. 
And, um, and I also, the, the other neat part that Shane taught me how to do like yesterday or the day before is that when the photoresistor detects a change in light, um, he randomizes between three different choreographed movements, which also makes him feel a lot more alive because each time he is liable to do something different or he might do the same thing two times in a row. One movement is very, very short. He just wiggles his tail and opens his mouth once. One is like fast movement of both for like two seconds. And another is like the slow tail wag, which is my favorite. Yeah, well, it'll happen. See, it also makes them have more of a mind of their own. In, in, in only in an aesthetic way, like, like the most surface level way. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so I worked on him throughout the month. I was able to try like a lot of different, like new things with him. This is just the current version. He's definitely not finished. Um, I'd like to add sound and give him, you know, some more like surface level details. Um, some more concept sketches for what I thought he might end up looking like. I mean, like drawing out like pattern shapes for the head that I could cut out of the fabric to get the right shape. Uh, over here for influences on him, I have popples and synapses. Uh, popples are like a vintage stuffed animal um, that have little pom-poms on them, which I kind of moved away from, but I, I like that that was one of the beginning thoughts. Um, and then here's the, here's the, here's what's going on in there. Um, this is the Arduino and this, this is the H drive that connects to his motors. The power runs through there so it doesn't fry the Arduino. Um, this purple and gray wire run to the photoresistor. Um, these two little ports. I hope that soon people can see my cursor, but like the motors connect here and here. And it can alternate like what which wire is like running power through it and that flips the direction the motor is rotating probably horrifying you guys with the way i'm describing <laughs> but i'm not ain't no roboticist until today i would actually just got promoted but um but i'm still learning all of this it's all incredibly new to me which i you know it this is i'm sure to many of you who are familiar with this building and do this kind of stuff this is incredibly rudimentary but what's important is like this is me coming from absolute ground zero just like 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 a few weeks ago i didn't know how to do any of this um so i think the fact that i was able to progress this far means that i'll be able to do a lot more very soon um, it represents a lot to me. This completely blows my practice wide open and um, alters the course of my career massively. Um, it changes what I can do. And it's really big to me. So yeah, that's his guts. And um, there were a couple other pictures just of like different like old toys I have that have been scanned to like show their insides, but not that important. There's some critter concepts. This slide is just like, visuals for things that I could do in the future but honestly it'll, it'll be even crazier than this who, who knows but yeah um I have a whole lot of ideas that now are a lot more possible because of what I learned here so thank you very much for the residency and for your time. <laughs> Um, and I would absolutely love to answer any questions or hear any comments also from the Zoom. Uh, if you were listening in the Zoom, please send in your questions. We can see them. Bailey. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for the people on Zoom, Bailey has asked, like, I usually make um, pastel creatures in very light, like, pinky and pastel colors, and um, this new one is in black faux fur. Um, and I have, in the last, um, last year or so, gotten a little burned out with the pastel body of work, so I would say I'm entering a different phase with, like, the type of visuals I'm going for, because, like, I still am evoking the same feelings of like softness and like, like gentleness without that color scheme. Um, just doing it in like different ways. Like I, I don't think I need that color scheme anymore to get that feeling. 
Um, and also I, I did a whole lot of critters that way. And now I'm just like, I want to try something new. And I found this nice faux fur at a really cool place in Chicago called um, the Waste Shed, which is like an art supply thrift store, similar to the resource exchange here, which um, is also an art supply thrift store, which is really cool. So yeah, I had the neat faux fur and I've been waiting to depart from the pastel color scheme anyway, because I've, I've just, I lived in that for a long time. Good question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> gentleman in the back <laughs> with the fresh new haircut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for sure. Um, yeah, for people on the Zoom, uh, the question from my friend Ben was, uh, a lot of the things I have here are fairly small compared to the things I've shown in the presentation, which are like around six feet long. Um, and will I ever do anything a lot larger that would require different methods? And I think Maybe, because um, I, I definitely want to increase the scale of my work, but I think that might be more in terms of like complexity and the narrative around it. Like I definitely want to go bigger, but to me maybe go, go bigger is like creating like a body of video work around these guys somewhat maybe akin to like Pee Wee's Playhouse, but like whatever iteration of that would happen if I were trying to do it. Like that's not the exact, but like that vibe I enjoy a lot. Um, or like going bigger by making them more responsive and a lot more complicated robotically. But I do really like the idea of increasing scale past what I've ever done. Like making something like taller is cool. It's it's a lot easier to make things long than make them tall with sculpture. Um, so making something very tall would be cool. And I definitely would have to do different things robotically because right now I'm operating with like a certain range of like power, like I'm like things that can plug into the wall with like a five volt adapter is like the the land that I can roam right now. Um, I had a picture of it, but there's a neat toy from the early 2000s called Butterscotch Pony that's like that big. And it's like a, supposed to be a sort of realistic pony for kids. And um, I, um, I would love to do something with one of those. And those use a, those use a lot more power and they're like fairly large and a lot, they have a lot more mechanisms going on. Um, and that would be cool. And I would definitely have to learn a lot more before I do that because they take like eight D batteries. Like they're ridiculous. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would take different skills, but I, I will gain them. <laughs> um, let's see. I think I have a question from the Zoom from my friend Nuri. It's very interesting how the process of making combines the digital practice of coding with the analog motion of robotics. Do you think you'll incorporate digital methods of interaction with your critters in future works? Hmm. If I understand your question correctly, that's like almost like if people were interacting with it, like, like through the internet, maybe you can confirm that via the chat, Nuri. But that would be really interesting. Like if it were almost like a zoo webcam situation where people could interact with the creature from abroad, like the like, what's an example? I know there are like aquariums where you can like activate a feeder for the fish at a certain time of day through the webcam. Like that would be really, really funny to do with the critters. Um, I do like that idea. That's a really good question. Um, the question I just got was, um, 
like, do I plan to investigate the way that children interact with my creatures more in the way that like they interact with interactive toys? And um, I don't know if I will actively pursue that, um, but it, it does always happen organically eventually, like at galleries. Um, I, I'm always a little worried when kids are around the creatures just because like there they are monsters and they are like kind of messed up looking. And I'm like, I hope that this doesn't scare the child. And um, they always really like them. They immediately approach them and pet them. Um, Sherman, the big like bug guy that I showed you, um, I, I had a show where he was like the focal point of it. And a little girl it, like ran up to me and was like, does he like flowers? And I was like, probably. And she was like, may I give him flowers? And I was like, yeah, I would, he would really, really like that. And like, she like picked some flowers for him from outside and like laid them in front of him and was petting him. And it was incredibly sweet. It makes me want to cry thinking about it right now. Um, so I'm always very surprised by how kids interact with them because, you know, they're a little spooky. Um, also how kids interact with um, like, like toys in, a, in an uncanny state, like the cat earlier with the like shell removed. So it was kind of horrifying. Uh, when I was at Bread and Puppet, there were a couple kids who lived there that were really funny. They were always running around um, having the ideal childhood of growing up at a puppet commune. Um, very jealous of them. And I was like skinning a Tickle Me Elmo to like make a sculpture out of it <laughs> while I was there. And they like walked behind me and were like, what are you doing? And I was like, please don't know. <laughs> don't, you don't, don't look at this. You don't want to see it. It's Elmo. It's, it's really sad. And like, and they were children. So of course they were like, no, we'll look. And they were, they like grabbed him and were like parading him around. They were like, Elmo's naked. Like it was like, it was the best thing ever to them. They were so stoked that I had taken the skin off of this Tickle Me Elmo. And then they were like going and getting the other kids so they could come look at it. And I was like, guys, I don't know. I don't know. Like the force of curiosity of kids often outweighs the, the seems uh, horror of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think kids are very much open to that exploration of what is going on in the things that they like to do. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the comment from Todd for the Zoom people um, was just that kids are usually, um, the, their curiosity overrides their disgust or trepidation. Yeah, which is very true. Um, yeah, the only people who are ever like, this is yucky and I don't like it are like adults. <laughs> this makes me super like, like you do you, but I don't want any part of what's going on here and I'll be leaving. Like I do get that reaction from them rarely. Um, yeah. But that's a really good question. And I, I hope to have more opportunities to see how children interact with them, but I don't know if I'll pursue it. Maybe though. Marina? I think for my own and I wonder if you could explain the yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And I definitely want someone over here to clarify on it after my answer, because I'll probably be wrong. But <laughs> um, but to my understanding, an automaton is um, basic. It's um, it is a mechanism that operates without power. It can be wind up or crank or um, uh, even like, I think there have been ones that have been powered by like water, like a mill. Um, there's no power source. And also they can only, they have their like gears that are on in a certain arrangement. So they're always like going through one track of movement that can never change. Hmm? Oh, I thought somebody said something. Um, yeah, and the, the difference being like um, an electronic, like I, a robot is then I think another step removed from that because then there's like the idea of like an electronic, which can be that just with the power source, I would say is the difference. <laughs> I'm probably wrong. And then a robot, I think like bases its behaviors off of information. That would be the main requirement for a robot. And I, actually though, whoa, big thought. Actually, I mean, the pattern of the gears that are controlling an automaton could be considered information. So uh, honestly, all of this is very fluid, but um, that I, I, I would say that my work has graduated from automata to robots here um, based on it. But um, if any of the, awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So it just acts as a long high, but if it just it's always sitting there breathing, I would consider that an on Yeah. But if it suddenly starts walk by or you press a button, that starts to gradually go off. Yeah. I don't think I'm able to repeat what the roboticists in the audience said with enough nuance, but basically robots respond to information, which can be stimulus or code, both, I guess. But yeah, they're just, you know, they're responding to something, whereas an automata is following a, a track at all times. Um, yeah, also, also a good question. Um, any more questions from the Zoom audience? Yes. Have you ever con considered creating stop motion shorts featuring your critters? I know it kind of defeats the whole automated thing, but I feel like it would be really interesting to combine the narrative nature of your comics and the 3D nature of the robots. Uh, I completely agree. And kind of what brought me, the reason that I got into sculpture was, was stop motion. Um, uh, long, long ago before I ever did any even like soft sculpture before I like was sewing, I um, in middle school had a stop motion phase as many awkward middle schoolers do. <laughs> um, and I was really obsessed with that for a while. The stop motion kind of had, follows a lot of the same sentiments that what I'm doing here does. It's both very sweet and nostalgic and also very uncanny. A lot of people cannot watch stop motion because it kind of triggers a, big, a visceral reaction because it is it's a very weird type of movement. It's a pretty common phobia to not like stop motion at all, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I would go back into stop motion, but doing video work with the critters is definitely something I'm going to do. That's from Barbara R. Thank you, Barbara R. From Zoom chat. Oh, Dan. Um, the question from Dan was, um, he says that I'm interacting with the audience in a somewhat educator-like way today, which I like, um, and, the, and would I ever pursue that more, um, and it, like, have that more of an educator relationship with my audience? And um, that's hard to see now, because I feel like I am still so, so deep in the learning stage. Like, I don't feel like I grasp anything I'm doing well enough to be imparting it to someone as like the main source, which is what I see as an, ed an educator as. Um, but I do really like the idea and it feels really, really good to feel like you're telling some someone something new. Like, like it, it's, it's more like sharing than educating for me. It's like, I just found this, you should hear about it as, a, as opposed to like, I know a lot about this and I want you to understand it. It's, I feel like more I'm like sharing right now, but I think someday it could be more like educating because that is something that feels really good. I think like letting someone in on something that they haven't heard before is, is one of the best feelings.
Does that answer the question? I don't know. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. That's the big one. Um, the question was like, why does my work center around animals a lot, right? Yeah. Um, and I grew up rurally. Um, I grew up on a farm. And I, I was also an only child living in the middle of nowhere. So animals were my primary um, interaction with another living thing at all. That, they were, they, that was my socialization <laughs> as a child. <laughs> I was <laughs> raised by chickens. That's not true. But, um, but I did, you know, I, I was an only child way out in the country. So I spent a lot of time with animals. And also, if you, spit, if, if you come from a rural background, you know that there is inherently just a lot of animal related trauma <laughs> to coming from there. Like you will see a lot of animals die. You will see a lot of bad things happen to a lot of them. And I think that that, I, th I think things that upset you early on are always going to impact what you take interest in later, um, at least for a lot of people and especially artists. So definitely like both my love and familiarity with animals as well as the um, like emotional turmoil I've experienced around them growing up on a farm is why big time. I've always been obsessed with them. They've always been the main thing I care about. All right, last call for questions, comments? Yes? I did, I did risograph the comment. Um, I printed it myself at Spudnik Press in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, um, I bet I would recognize him if I saw him. <laughs> yeah, and oh, also important note, I have copies of the comic here if you would be interested in purchasing one. Um, I also have stickers. Or if you just like to like hold it in your hands and see it, that's cool too. Yeah, um, love, love risography. It's uh, the only kind of printing that I like to do. So that's how I always make my comics. Yeah. Does one of the tech experts want to see if they can open the Zoom where I can see it for me? So I can just like see my friends in the Zoom. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's just the chat on my screen. <laughs> Okay, well, there's some people. I hope the view of me was okay. Actually, I wasn't like this the whole time. Here first. And here. Oh, oh, great. Thank you. That's exactly what I want. Thanks, wow. Weishi. Another shout out for Weishi. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, the Zoom. Um, I guess people in the Zoom probably didn't get to see a lot of the like other stuff going on. Um, I'll at least show you guys the critter I made here. Yeah. So not the not the greatest view of him with my terrible laptop webcam, but oh, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about this. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll turn him on. In a second. Um, yeah. So let's see if I can get him moving. This is different lighting than he's calibrated for right now. <laughs> Not the ideal way to see him, but I'll definitely post pictures of him and video on Instagram later. Um, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, thank you so much, everybody in the Zoom. Hi, Nat. Um, any other questions from the Zoom while I'm standing here? Hi, Alice. I just have to sit next to the Bye, y'all. Yeah. Why are you guys on the? Oh, it's
Thanks for coming. Awesome job. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out of here. It was wonderful to get to talk to all of you. Thank you.